Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear from Michael Pento of Pento Portfolio Strategies on how the broken window fallacy is now becoming a part of the narrative surrounding the terrible tragedy in the Houston area, and also talks about an exciting setup he sees in the gold market and what will be the tipping point. Don't miss another wonderful interview with Austrian economist and money manager Michael Pento coming up after this week's market update. Precious metals markets enter trading for the month of September with some strong upside momentum on the heels of a late summer rally. Two point on Monday, gold has broke out above the $1,300 resistance level to new highs for the year. As of this Friday recording, gold trades at $1,323 an ounce, up 2.4% on the week. Gold's gains are being confirmed by the gold mining stocks, which are now putting in their biggest weekly up moves of the summer. Turning to the white metals, silver shows a weekly gain of 3.3% to bring spot prices to $17.69 an ounce. Platinum poked above the $1,000 level on Thursday and currently trades at $1,007 an ounce on the heels of this week's 2.9% advance. Its sister metal, palladium, is up 3.9% to $966. Metals markets responded to the carnage inflicted by Hurricane Harvey and the inflationary implications for U.S. fiscal policy. Lawmakers return to Capitol Hill next Tuesday. They will take up a Harvey aid bill expected to cost tens of billions of dollars. Whether it's a clean bill or is tied to unrelated pork barrel spending or an increase in the debt limit remains to be seen. The Treasury Department had said that the debt ceiling must be raised by September 29th. Officials now say that the deadline may move forward by a couple of days because of disaster relief spending. These developments will make it more difficult for Freedom Caucus members of Congress to win any spending concessions. President Donald Trump still intends to push for tax reform. Senate Republicans will be under tremendous pressure to deliver something on that front after they failed spectacularly on Obamacare repeal. Here's what Trump had to say in a speech earlier this year. We need a tax code that is simple, fair, and easy to understand. That means getting rid of the loopholes and complexity that primarily benefit the wealthiest Americans and special interests. Our last major tax rewrite was 31 years ago, and I am fully committed to working with Congress to get this job done, and I don't want to be disappointed by Congress. The president did get some good news on the economy this week. U.S. GDP growth got revised upward to a better-than-expected 3%. Good news is often interpreted by markets as bad news for metals markets. A stronger economy makes the Federal Reserve more likely to tighten monetary policy. But this week, good news was good for stocks, commodities, and precious metals. The bad news out of Texas may have something to do with that. Given the tremendous financial stresses on millions of families who have either been impacted or flooded out of their homes, the Fed is likely to hold off on any new rate hikes or quantitative tightening for a while. Central bankers don't want to be perceived as villains for causing rates on mortgages and home improvement loans to rise. Yet in keeping rates artificially low, central bankers are complicit in inflating asset bubbles to dangerous proportions. The stock market certainly wouldn't be trading where it is today without Fed stimulus. The sky-high costs of health insurance and college tuitions wouldn't be where they are now either. In order to help qualified students pay for the ever-rising costs of higher education, Money Metals Exchange has teamed up with the Sound Money Defense League for a scholarship fund. It is the first gold-backed scholarship of the modern era. We're setting aside 100 ounces of physical gold for scholarships to outstanding undergraduate and graduate students who display deep understanding of economics and monetary policy. For 2017, we will be awarding this scholarship to two incoming or current undergraduate students and two graduate students. First place winners will receive $2,000 each, with runners-up getting $1,000. 
Applicants must submit an essay that answers a specific question about free markets and sound money. Essays will be reviewed by a blue ribbon committee of professors, economists, and executives of Money Metals Exchange and the Sound Money Defense League. The application and essay must be submitted by September 30th, 2017. If you have a college student in your family who is interested in free market economics and sound monetary policies, be sure to let him or her know about this scholarship opportunity. For more information or to apply, please visit moneymetals.com forward slash scholarship. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to welcome in Michael Pento, president and founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies and author of the book, The Coming Bond Market Collapse, How to Survive the Demise of the U.S. Debt Market. Michael is a well-known and successful money manager and has been a regular guest on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business News, and also the Money Metals podcast and shares his astute insights on markets and geopolitics from the perspective of an Austrian school economist viewpoint. It's always a real pleasure to have him on with us. Michael, welcome back and how are you? I'm doing fine, and thank you for having me back on, Mike. Well, Michael, let's start out here with the topic that is dominating the news. Uh, Hurricane Harvey has laid waste to Houston and the Texas Gulf Coast, uh, but Wall Street doesn't seem to be bothered. Uh, gold and silver have got a, a bit of a boost, but the equity market shrugged it off. This all makes me think back of the parable of the broken window, which was introduced by the well-known 19th century economist Frederick Bastier, where he described why the money spent to recover from destruction is not actually a benefit to society. But Michael, it appears as though Wall Street and the financial world might be buying into the idea of the broken window fallacy and viewing it as truth and, and that all the destruction will somehow be good for the economy. What are your comments there and, and what do you make of the market's initial response here to this terrible, terrible tragedy? I guess it's part of the hyperbole and hysteria that encompasses Wall Street right now. Uh, nothing can knock down the stock market. You didn't even mention the fact that North Korea, Kim Jong-un, this new regime, he launched his 80th Scud missile in their ICBMs, ballistic missiles, into the Sea of Japan and over Japan and towards uh, southern uh, South Sea of Japan. And nobody seems to care. And as a matter of fact, the market rallied from being down about 150 points in the pre-market to, uh, I think, plus 58 on the Dow yesterday. So there's nothing that practically can, nothing can harm this market. And the reason for that, the simple reason behind that, is that central banks have printed $15 trillion worth of confetti and counterfeit money leading out of the financial crisis from 2008 till today. $15 trillion and counting you know, don't forget, you still have 60 billion euros per month over in Europe. And you've got the Swiss uh, Central Bank. You've got the Bank of Japan, which is hopelessly enamored with money printing. And at least Mr. Kuroda, the head of the BOJ, understands that he can never, never even think about or hint about reducing his quantitative easing or QQE program that he has. But going back to... Um, Frederic Peste, Wall Street, very, a very low level of thinking, a very idiotic group of individuals who actually, I was listening to CNBC comment about how, hard, and by the way, my heart and my prayers go out to the, the people in Houston and, in, and now in Louisiana, but I heard a commentator on the show saying, hey, but let's look at the good, the good news here. Look at all the construction that's going to happen. So this is actually a boom for the economy. Well, you know, if you follow that philosophy, then we might as well just bulldoze all of the houses and all of the physical structures in the United States. And that's how you grow GDP. You don't grow GDP through productivity. And you don't grow GDP by increasing and boosting your labor force. The new way of growing productivity now is to break things and to pray for catastrophic storms. Of course, they never think about where the money comes from. In other words, if I was going to fix this this pane of glass in the uh, in the uh, analogy that you brought up, the broken window analogy, well, I was going to buy a pair of shoes, and now I have to spend that money on fixing the, the pane of glass. Or if I have to just borrow that money, that money that's borrowed to fix the glass would have been borrowed to perhaps buy capital goods and expand the economy. And, of course, if that money is just printed, well, then we have the, 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 the scourge of inflation. 
So there is no magic, there is no free lunch in anything, and especially in, economy, in, in economics, that's true. When the flooding in Texas moves out of the news, uh, the coming fight over the debt ceiling could be front and center. Now, it looked like to us a, a fight was brewing with a contingent of conservative Republicans revolting on one flank and, and Democrats looking to thwart Trump and his agenda everywhere possible on another. Uh, Trump and GOP leadership had their hands full getting a bill to hike the borrowing limit passed. But it, it could be that Hurricane Harvey will be used to prevent a, a big fight here, relief for Texas. Uh, might be inserted into the bill to raise the borrowing cap, and, and few politicians will object for fear of being criticized. Uh, so with that said, are you expecting a fight over the debt ceiling to be significant, Michael, and any chance we could see a government shutdown here? Well, my, my first uh, glance, Prima Fauci, look at this, is that I expect more dysfunction in D.C. Uh, I predicted this when Donald Trump was elected. I said that his massive reform of health care his tax reform packages would be both diluted and delayed, and that's exactly what has happened. And, of course, Wall Street likes to look at every event as a positive. The glass is always half full. So now they're saying that we have a hurricane that we have to pay for, that this is going to somehow make the passage of everything, tax reform, construction spending, infrastructure, the debt ceiling, the budget, Everything is going to go smoothly. I mean, I have my doubts. I, have, I run an actively managed portfolio. So the base case scenario is dysfunction in D.C. That has been very, very prudent and a, and, a, and a correct path to assume and to take. I believe it's not going to go smoothly. I believe that we have to pass the budget by the end of September and raise the debt ceiling by the middle of October. Now, Mnuchin and Mulvaney, they, they were on opposite sides of this, but now they're on the same talking points as Trump. They just want to raise the debt ceiling cleanly. But I, I don't think the Tea Party Republicans in the House of Representatives are going to go along with that. So yes, there will be a fight, even if they try to attach this uh, hurricane spending bill, infrastructure bill to it. The U.S. dollar isn't uh, looking too good these days. We've seen a pretty steady decline since the beginning of the year. Of course, the dollar is a terribly flawed instrument, and the fact that the DXY index traded at an all-time high late last year was more a testament to just how bad other major world currencies must be. Uh, but where do you think we're going from here? Is, is the dollar going to head lower? Well, we went from about 80 on the DXY, which is heavily weighted towards uh, the euro, and from 80 to above 100 in anticipation of what? Uh, of anticipation of Mr. Trump getting a lot of his agenda passed rather quickly. And also the divergence between the two major central banks, between the ECB and the Federal Reserve. And whereas we see now things not shaking out that well at all, we see the dollar index has dropped from above 100 now to major support around 92. If it breaks through 92 on the DX way, I think it could head towards 80. Um, and all eyes are on the ECB. The ECB is, is, is primarily in charge here. I, if Mario Draghi on September 7th announce, announces a tapering of his $60 billion per euro a month asset purchase program, I would expect the euro to skyrocket and the dollar to fall precipitously right through that 92 towards 80. And, of course, if he does not taper his asset purchase program, then the dollar could catch a bid and head back towards 100. So that's why, again, I run an actively managed portfolio. It's trying to guess the minds of these megalomaniac schizophrenics that run central banks. is very, very difficult. So it's best to have not a passive ETF strategy, buy and hold, and then forget about your money. You have to actively manage your, your, your portfolio. So I will react to what Mario Draghi does. European uh, GDP growth is getting stronger. They are missing on the inflation target, just as we are here in the United States, at least the way central banks measure inflation. If you don't, ca if you don't count everything that's going up, like medical costs and college tuition and asset prices. So who knows what they're going to do, but you have to be reactive uh, rather than just proactive in this kind of environment. Staying on monetary policy here for a moment. Any thoughts on where Trump goes with his Fed chair appointee early next year? Any chance Yellen gets reappointed, or does he bring in somebody even more dovish? What do you think? Uh, <laughs> well, it's hard to get someone more dovish than Janet Yellen, but um, I, I guess, you know, I don't have any special insight here. Um, Gary Cohen will, would be my 
my best guess, because Trump likes to put his fingerprint on everything. And he needs somebody in there who is going to really fight for low interest rates and for deregulation policy. So Yellen kind of submarined herself at Jackson Hole talking about the importance of regulation in the banking system. So my best guess is that come February 2018, that we have a new Fed chair, and that person is Gary Cohn, who will really fight hard for low interest rates and a weak dollar. Both those things espoused by our, by our President Trump. Not candidate Trump, President Trump. There's a difference. Yeah, very important distinction there for sure. Uh, let's dig into the gold and silver markets here for a minute. Now, demand in the retail bullion market continues to be pretty soft. Uh, to our way of thinking, that can be largely attributed to a, a few factors. First off, bullion investors are, are more optimistic about a Trump presidency than the Obama presidency. Another is that uh, precious metals prices really haven't been going anywhere for a while now. And then also uh, those who have been buying gold and silver as a safe haven have probably just gotten exhausted. They've been on high alert expecting significant fallout resulting from ultra-loose Fed policy, massive federal deficits, unlimited borrowing, etc. But the reckoning is never seems to come. So are, are bullion investors just going to have to live a while longer here in purgatory, or do you see anything exciting developing in the months ahead for the metals? Oh, I see something very, I see something very exciting developing. So we have a condition here across the, the United States and in Europe, not in Japan, as I mentioned, where we have central banks that absolutely believe they have solved all of the global economic problems. And what they have done instead, they've, they've engendered, they've fostered a huge increase in debt. We have about a $70 trillion increase in debt coming out of the Great Recession. We have $230 trillion of debt now in the globe. It's about uh, 330%, just about 330% of, of global GDP. And the entire global economy, as, as anemic as it is, and people talk about this global synchronized growth, the, the global growth is not anywhere near where it was in the early 2000s. We're about, globally speaking, you look at the major developed economies, they're about 1%, 1 to 2%. Um, so there is no big expanse in global growth. But whatever global growth there is, it totally and completely hinges on continued low interest rates. And central banks are now convinced that they've solved all our problems, as I said. And now you look at the Fed, who, who ended QE in 2014, and now we're getting ready for quantitative tightening, reverse QE to start this year. And surely... I'm 100% convinced if it doesn't start in September, at least in early part of 2018, Mario Draghi and the ECB will start to taper its assets. They were $80 billion, now they're $60 billion. He's going to be reducing his asset purchase program to, towards zero, certainly by the end of 2018. So when that happens, you're going to have, you know, the Fed, and the Fed likes to talk about tapering. They're not selling asset per, uh, assets. They're, they're just letting them roll off the balance sheet. Assets do not roll off of a Fed's balance sheet. When the Federal Reserve has a note due, what they're going to do is ask the Treasury to pay them this note. Well, the Treasury has no money. So the Treasury has to sell an amount equal to the note due to the Fed. The Treasury then has to not only sell this debt, but has to now service this debt, whereas before those interest payments were being refunded by the Fed to the Treasury. And when the Fed gets this money, it's retired. So you're talking about a draining of the money supply. You're talking about that happening not only in the United States, but also in Europe. And who's going to buy all this debt? Now, the debt is absolutely, as I said, skyrocketed, $70 trillion increase. There isn't any private source for this funding. No one is going to buy uh, a German Bund yielding 0.37% when there is no central bank around and the central bank is getting ready to sell assets. There isn't anybody who's going to buy a U.S. 10-year note yielding 2.2% or 2.15 as we make this recording. Nobody is going to make that purchase when the Federal Reserve is getting ready to sell trillions of dollars, they have $4.5 trillion balance sheet. If they take it down to 2 and a half, it's $2 trillion worth of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. They're going to be adding, accretive to, 
the trillion dollar deficit that we already have, and deficits go up huge as in, as interest rates go up. Interest rates rise is a very vicious uh, counterproductive cycle. And if we have higher debt service costs for every one percent, two hundred billion dollars, we have one trillion dollar in deficits because of demogra- demographics. And if we have a recession, deficits will rise and buy an additional trillion dollars. So we can have deficits well over two to approaching $3 trillion with no help from the government. This is going to cause whatever relatively economic, uh, anemic economic growth to falter substantially. And I will add this. We already have the automotive sector and the real estate sector rolling over in this country. If we have a spike in interest rates, which will emanate from the ECB whenever they decide to start tapering assets and the German boom rises towards nominal GDP, which is close to 3%, actually above 3%, you go from 0.37% to over 3%, that's going to drag up yields across the globe, and that's when this is, the situation is really going to be extremely pernicious. And what's going to happen then, now gold, the gold market is already sniffing this out, by the way, is that we breached $1,300 an ounce not too long ago, a couple of days ago. The gold market is sniffing out this that central banks are going to have to get back into the QE programs across the board. And when that happens, faith in fiat currencies, not not just the dollar, all fiat currencies, is going to falter very dramatically. And you see some of this not only in the gold market, but you see this phenomenon in the cryptocurrency world. There is going to be a dramatic watershed trenchant drop in, in the faith of central bankers. That's the biggest bubble of all. And when that pops, gold's going to go back to its all-time high and well surpassing that level, too. So look for $2,000 an ounce gold. It's going to happen rather quickly. I think it's going to happen within the next couple of years. And you already see the beginnings of that happening today. Well, we'll leave it there. Fantastic stuff, as always, Michael. It's uh, great to have you on, and we respect your insights quite a bit, and it's uh, excellent to have you join us every few months. Now, before we let you go, as we always do, please tell people who want to both read and hear more of your wonderful market commentaries and also learn about your firm and how they could potentially become a client if they want to do that. Uh, Please tell them how they can find out more information. Sure, you can email me directly, mpento at pentoport.com. My website is www.pentoport.com, and the office number here is 732-772-9500. Be glad to talk to you. Well, thanks again, Michael. Enjoy the Labor Day weekend, and we look forward to catching up with you again later this year. Take care, my friend. Thanks again for having me back on, Mike. Well, that will wrap it up for this week. Thanks again to Michael Pento of Pento Portfolio Strategies. For more information, visit pentoport.com. That's P-E-N-T-O-P-O-R-T.com. You can sign up for his email list, listen to the midweek podcast that he does, and get his fantastic market commentaries on a regular basis. Again, just go to pentoport.com. And don't forget to check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great Labor Day weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.